as we usually do. Welcome to this, our 17th episode of Apex Instant Tips, coming to you live every Friday at 12.05 Eastern time for five minutes only from Massachusetts. My name is Hayden. And I'm Anton. And Hayden, I noticed that this week we're coming at 12.05 Eastern time, not Eastern Standard Time. Uh, that is right. I am up to here with uh, time zones. I'm done calling them out. Now it's Eastern time. <laughs> no, no more of those Eastern Daylight Savings time. People can figure it out on their own. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Anton, I noticed you have a, a special moniker today. What is the significance of Spatafor? Uh, yes. So uh, this tip in particular, um, we spent a lot of time back and forth considering the security implications of, of a whole bunch of different things and a lot of time um, spent just working that out and being confirmed. And, and during all that time, I was, I was reminded of the times that I used to spend late into the evening working with uh, Scott Spadafore, a former, uh, well, a member of the or Apex community uh, and a dear friend of mine. It, as it turns out, this Sunday is uh, the 11th anniversary of Scott's uh, early passing. And so today, uh, this tip will be an homage to our good friend, Scott, and uh, I hope he will be proud. Yes, uh, it's a, a nice tribute. So let's get into it. Um, uh, today's tip is on the subject of Markdown's integration with Apex. So let me start a little bit um, uh, removed from the from that specific topic. So I'm going to- yeah, I'm going to kick off the, have you kick off the timer? I know we're yeah. going to cheat a little bit. This is a big tip. So let's see what we can do. Yeah, so, so let's start with a scenario that I think all of our users will be familiar with. Uh, you have uh, a, a table with um, HTML uh, or other formatted text, and you want to display it in, in a report. So here I have an interactive report, a common, uh, so, and, and we see the HTML here, a common method for um, uh, rendering this HTML will be to go to the column in this report and uh, switching off escape special characters and uh, oh. Africa, now it renders as desired. Anton, what is your beef with this? My beef with this is, Oh my gosh, the security implications. Uh, you have just opened up your application to cross-site scripting in a way that is just unsatisfactory and we cannot recommend. You could whitelist this though. You could go in and, and in your select statement, use the Apex whitelisting, quite tedious. I'm hoping we have a better solution. Yes, and uh, our um, some of our more dedicated uh, viewers may remember that we covered whitelisting and recommendations for that in the episode about using the bang raw syntax. Right. I want a solution that does this declaratively, accessibly, uh, and removes uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Uh, if you are lucky enough to be in Apex 20.2, uh, there is a feature in the classic report uh, that allows you to do this with no effort. So uh, what is this magic? If we visit um, this uh, classic report, there's a new column type called markdown. And as we see, all I have to do is, is turn it on the markdown type and this the same HTML is now uh, displaying beautifully. And despite being HTML and not markdown, the Apex engine, um, what Apex has done is they spit out into your browser the escaped HTML. So there's no cross-site scripting issue there. And then they use the marked JavaScript library to unescape only the HTML that Apex, the Apex team has decided is valid and it and it sanitizes it. I love it. Yeah. So that in essence is the tip. But let's take a moment to actually explore what Markdown is and why you should consider it. So right, because uh, you could actually use Markdown instead of HTML. And in my mind, that's a better solution. Yeah. So I'm not a big fan of it, of HTML. Um, it's uh, it, it it takes a lot of character counts to write all of those tags. It is tedious, um, and I feel it often. It I spend a lot of time. Uh, uh, massaging the look and feel of something that, and, and I just want it to be simple. So yeah. here we're looking at an example of Markdown. Our, our, many of our viewers may already be familiar with it. They've seen it on Stack Overflow. Um, An Anton, what is your uh, view of, of this? I think it's great. I think it also gives a consistent design feel throughout your application. If you have your users use Markdown instead, and with this new Markdown editor, they can do Markdown. If you click preview, you can actually see the Markdown. And even in the rich text editor, you can output Markdown instead of HTML. So I think you have a lot of advantages to this. Um, but the key element to this editor 
is Hayden. So I am a sucker for, um, so I write a lot of technical documentation and I love being able to quote code attractively. And, and I'm not gonna let you keep going here. I'm gonna make you copy that code and we're gonna move right into the, if you want to use Markdown in the rest of your application, you can continue on to page zero and you can create a dynamic action. And that dynamic action can execute just a couple lines of JavaScript code that Hayden was showing. And what this does is it loops through anything that has the class, my Markdown on it, will have the marked function run against it. And it will convert anything with that class that has Markdown in it to HTML on your page. So all we have to do is create it, for example, anything anywhere in the application, a display only item, for example, and apply that class to it. So here I have, um, uh, this is uh, unrendered Markdown. Um, let me uh, make use of this uh, page zero dynamic action. I am going to apply the class that we just saw, my Markdown. And uh, let's see if I got yeah, my Markdown save and and Abracadabra. Now uh, the Markdown is being rendered as desired. And we have 30 seconds. We actually have one little hack that has to happen. In order for this to work, we have to get Apex to spit the Markdown JavaScript out onto the page. What we did was we created a um, region that's never shown, but with a Markdown editor item on it. That puts the JavaScript that we need onto the page. A little bit of a hack, but it works. Um, I will also point out the way we've done it, you only you don't get the HTML conversion, but we can set some options, which we'll later um, talk about uh, another time. Uh, maybe you'll write a blog. <laughs> maybe in the way of a blog. I will not commit this time, but um, hopefully. Uh, we made that in just five minutes. I know that we cut. I cut you off at one point, but I'm glad I did, just so we could finish. There, there was a lot of material there, and, and we needed to keep a solid clip. Right, and as we always do, um, we will invite folks to um, stick around for the wisdom of the week and uh, the answer to last week's puzzler. And if you have additional questions on this topic, there's still more that we could certainly cover on it. But for those of you who don't, who don't want to stick around, you just came in for the five minutes, do all of the things. I'm out of breath, Hayden. What are they supposed to do? If you're only here for five minutes, get out of here. <laughs> That's it, get out of here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, wow. So I encourage you to come up with questions that you might have on this. Um, uh, but in the meantime, the, this week's wisdom of the week, uh, we foreshadowed just a little bit in our opening conversation. And that is that dates and times, especially time zones, are hard. And it's just best to rely on the underlying tech stack to do it for you. Yes. And perhaps this is worthy of a tip in and of itself, but you have converted uh, converted me to the virtues of uh, timestamp with local time zone instead of just using date. Um, so I have that in my uh, quick SQL settings. Um, so I'm, I'm very on board with this wisdom. Right, and I think that, that this very well may foreshadow a an upcoming topic. But I think even when you're using um, just date calculations, if you're, you know, people I see subtract dates and, and do this kind of thing, Ape or Oracle has built into the engine date manipulations, add months, um, months between, those kinds of things. Definitely use those. Yes, I, I, I think this is this is worthy of, of a definitely worthy of a tip because I myself am guilty of of doing date comparisons without using the special um, functions and procedures. So for the moment, we will leave that as a wisdom of the week, but we perhaps will revisit it. Um, Yes. Um, there are a couple other things. Um, uh, and I, uh, I see in the comments that there is a catch with timestamp with local time zone. And I'll say that, I'll give a, a hint, there are two catches with timestamp with local time zone. The first catch with it is that it relies on the underlying database time zone. And as long as your database time zone never changes, and in my opinion, it really never should, you're, the, you won't have any problems with these dates being messed up. But if somebody were to change the underlying database time zone, all of the dates that have uh, timestamp with local time zone will shift by a, whatever number of hours the time zone changes to be. And so um, I recommend that your your database time zone be, um, be Greenwich Mean Time 
or whatever. I think there's some other moniker for it now, but right. Zulu time, Zulu time. The other catch with it, which I believe will be solved at some point before long in Apex is when Apex um, does automatic time zone. Uh, oh, this is a whole other topic. When Apex does automatic time zone though, it doesn't, doesn't handle well when you cross a different time zone. Um, it looks at the time zone that you're in today and renders it. But that's a topic that we can actually do as a tip as well. Uh, but those are the those are two catches, one with the database and one specific to Apex. Yeah. Um, no. UTC, I, I, thank you. <laughs> we, should, we should definitely come back to this. Yeah, yes. And thank you. Um, I, I was saying GMT, it's UTC that I should be saying that. Yeah. Uh, any questions uh, so far about our uh, our markdown tip? Ah, really nice. Can you give some tip to display code with good style JavaScript? Uh, well, per personally, I I'm not um, that picky about it. I, I feel that um, uh, if your if your starting place is having to uh, represent code using the rich text editor you'll have no complaints when it comes to the Markdown editor and being able to use that inline code um, uh, functionality. Uh, and different platforms will have different bells and whistles that allow you to display um, uh, code attractively. At Insum, we do in fact use WordPress and there's a very nice feature that allows you to do that. But and, Yeah, and I think um, that's a good point. What we're really trying to do today's tip is to highlight there are some features right in Apex already there declaratively that you can use or with minimal a minimal um, little PLC, a little dynamic action with a a little bit of a hack that you can get you get it for free. Um, mm -hmm. But there are certainly other options if you if you're really going to be doing a lot of code um, that that could come into play. Um, one thing that we uh, didn't get around to, to discussing, Anton, and, and I'd love to get your take on it, is um, uh, some of our viewers may not be very familiar with Markdown, or maybe they have concerns that um, Markdown syntax is limiting. Uh, let's say you want to uh, uh, programmatically store uh, uh, text that you want to then pass into an email body, and you want it to be an HTML syntax. Uh, uh, is it limiting to uh, write it in Markdown? So. I'll start by answering that. Is it limiting? I think it's limiting in a good way. Um, if you if you really restrict it to Markdown and and not to additional HTML, I think that's good because you're going to get design elements that ultimately align with the document that it's integrated into into your Apex application or into your email. Um, but uh, if you're start stored it in Markdown, for example, in a club or a, a Varchar two or something in the in the database, and you want to integrate it into an email, you can easily call a web service and have that web service convert the markdown into HTML, and then you'd put that in. So really, I don't see any downside at that at, at all to that. You can call there, you can write your own um, web service to do this very easily, but there are other web services you could use to easily convert markdown to HTML. Um, so I don't think there's any challenge there at all. Um, uh, good answer. Uh, um, the other thing, um, uh, it does it by TZ offset and not locale. Yes, um, jo Joel has commented that um, the Apex engine, Apex is doing um, the uh, the conversion. When you use timestamp with local time zone, Apex is using the, T the time zone offset, negative five or something, as opposed to the location based. Um, and we do actually have a little bit of code that, that fixes that. Um, and I'm hoping at some point Apex will actually do that as well. Um, so that's, I've rewound a couple of times now. Um, the other thing that I do want to point out is um, that the Apex team has chosen a whole bunch of very good options when they use the uh, the marked converter, the marked translator in a classic report. We have not done that in our little um, in our little dynamic action, but you certainly could. You could apply the same options. That, that the Apex engine does to classic reports to any markdown within your, your system. So you could, in fact, convert HTML or anything else, depending on what options you choose. Um, thank you, Joel. I appreciate that we need to fix it. Uh, um, so we are coming up against the amount of time we like to spend in this show. Um, and 
as I've alluded to before, this five minute show um, took us probably 500 minutes each <laughs> to come up with. Uh, but we do want to make sure we give the answer to last week's puzzler. So Hayden, what do we have for a puzzler from last yes. week? Yes, so let's just quickly uh, tee it up again. Um, I had uh, received this uh, puzzler from a friend and um, I then shared it with the audience. It actually got quite a bit of discussion going. So uh, we have a, a sealed jar that weighs one kilo, we're on planet Earth, et cetera. Um, inside of this sealed jar, we have half a kilo was worth of flies that are flying about. So they're in motion within the jar. This is a uh, giant jar. Within this giant jar and these heavy flies. Uh, it's on a scale, what does the scale read? Is it one kilo, 1.5 kilos, half kilo, or some fourth option? And as it turns out, the answer is one and a half kilos. Yeah, obviously, well, perhaps not, but most people would agree that if the flies were all on the sitting on the, the ground, it would be one and a half kilos. And once they start to fly, they actually exert a half a kilo of air pressure downward onto the system. Now, if you've been underneath an airplane when it flies overhead, um, you, you don't feel that airplane flying overhead, but that's because it's so far and the, the weight of it is so dispersed that you don't notice it. But as a pilot myself, I can tell you, for example, if I'm landing a very small plane and I'm coming in landing behind a very large plane, I'm instructed to make sure that my flight path is always above the flight path that that larger plane flew over. And so I actually land farther down the runway than that plane did in order to make sure that I don't get caught in this downdraft that is real. And I, I can say I have been there. Um, so despite not feeling it as the planes go by, if you were relatively close to that flight path, you would you would feel it. And of course, if those um, all of those flies were flying directly above your head, you would feel that half, half a kilo. Um, I, uh, uh, that is a great answer and um, uh, very cool to think about. Um, uh, I, I might classify it in fact as a mind. <laughs> yes, it is definitely a mind, uh, one of those. Yes. Sorry, uh, the, the sensor thing only works for me. Only works for you, excellent. Um, and Joel asks, does it matter if the jar is covered or not? And the, the reality is, it doesn't really matter as long as the flies are all within the, the, the confines of the jar. Um, the, 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 the cap being sealed on the jar really doesn't, there's some possibility that the, that the airflow might spill over a little bit. So you might not end up with exactly 1.5 kilos. It might be 1.47 or something like that. But um, there have been good experiments done that, that not only does the, the mat, not only does it work in uh, theory, it works in practice. Right, and uh, if, if any of our uh, viewers are fans of Mythbusters, there's in fact an episode that is um, that doesn't deal with the flies in the jar uh, scenario, but it deals with uh, geese in a truck bed. Um, oh, completely different. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they they reach the same, perhaps unintuitive conclusion. Wonderful. Well, uh, folks have wasted a perfectly good, it looks like 18 minutes listening to our frivolous show. Um, we want to thank everyone for uh, joining and be sure to do all the things that um, our producers tell us you're supposed to do. Uh, write letters to your friends. Subscribe. Your yes. Subscribe, ring the bell, all that. I see everyone next Friday. Thanks so much, Hayden, for uh, the trip down memory lane. Absolutely.